trying to get log on for some reason. They're having a little bit of difficulty. But can everyone hear us okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. It's been a little bit, of, uh, a little bit of a time here since we've done this, and uh, so what we suggested uh, is for people to submit some questions so that we make sure we cover that. And what we wanted to create today was more of a, of a reestablishing affinity with, with us, with you. And so no better way than to really access your thoughts, your, your um, questions in a, in a way that we can address those while we're also bringing across our message that we wanted to do. Um, and so versus just standing here and addressing ingredients and protocols and things like that, we're going to kind of weave the questions. Um, Taisha's going to read them off and I'm going to answer a lot of them. Because um, I think it's, a, it's important. All of you are in the same industry. You're doing the same thing. You may not have thought of a question, but yet when you hear it and you hear the response, you can very much see the value of that in the sense where you can open up tomorrow morning and have something to really initiate your practice, whether it be a data point, a successful action, uh, a new protocol, uh, something like that, versus just information. Um, so there's still people jumping on. So we're going to wait just about another minute or two, then we can get started. So Dr. Aguilar, are we going to talk about the antioxidant mask and maybe catalyst too as a new supplement? Can we talk about that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I have a, a question regarding the, uh, oh, you mean the antioxidant mask? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the thing of it is with this whole ingredient and this whole sort of line of command and chain of command with ingredients and uh, the ports being closed and gas prices and all this stuff, it, it, it's really reinitiating um, a need to reestablish uh, relationships with with uh, growers and and the logistics to get it here in time. And so there's just a lot that goes on behind closed doors or behind the background that uh, it's also an opportunity. Like I always want to make sure that if there's a challenge or roadblock, then we need to kind of understand that there's a reason why that is and then use it as an opportunity. So some of the ingredients in the antioxidant mask um, uh, were amazing, very stable, um, but at the same time, they were a little bit outdated in the sense mm -hmm. that um, I found that since we're going to have to find new ingredients and new sources, let's make sure that we have the best sources, the best ingredients, and if there's any um, improvements that we can make, then we're going to do that at the same time. Um, so that's what some of the formulas are going through right now. Um, and we just, obviously some of you have seen and had, gotten your hands on some of the, the new formulas with the um, antioxidant mask. Uh, it basically smells the same, looks the same, feels a little better, but acts at a higher performance. It just delivers a lot better uh, molecular structure uh, activity, um, it, uh, it blends better, um, it uh, removes a lot easier than the one before. So as far as performance is concerned, it's like a, you know, a 1985 car versus a 2002 in the sense of what it does and how it performs. Um, so as time goes on, a lot of the science and research is encroaching on other industries and the skincare industry is no, no ex exception. And that once we know certain ingredients or certain formulas or certain uh, vitamins or constituents are doing what they say they're doing, then they're slowly kind of integrating into our formulas. Now, just to cover some of the things, 25 years ago, we were the first ones to initiate uh, progesterones in some of our formulas. Uh, why? It's because we're as mostly women are in a progesterone deficiency. I kept seeing in my practice how estrogen was dominating the skincare industry, the shampoo industry, 
uh, the environmental aggressors, the plastics, all these things were estrogen dominant. And so progesterone, I mean, including birth control, um, were estrogen in, in nature. So progesterone was one that was just not uh, balancing women's hormonal balance. And since we're using something transdermal, we use 0.06% of a, of a uh, pharmaceutical grade wild yam progesterone, right? Not enough to increase it as a transdermal hormone replacement therapy, but enough to stimulate fibroblasts, enough to increase the laydown of new collagen, to fight um, glycation, and to just bring in some of those missing ingredients. And progesterone is one of the most important ones in women. Uh, again, no one's, I don't think no one's even done it yet because they just don't want to go in that direction, but we've been doing it safely and effectively for 25 years. Um, stem cells is another one. We were the first ones to initiate that um, along with, we, we're going to talk a little bit more and, and rehash the marriage process and how the molecular structures of ionic ingredients bond so that we don't have to use um, preservatives, but yet still have like a two to three year least of uh, shelf life. So these are all things that we've initiated, we've been using successfully for many, many, many years, and we still stick to those, those um, principles, but yet because they are now, for instance, ingredients that are shown to, to really outperform some of the other ones, then that's what we're bringing into the mix, but still making sure that we're staying within uh, the ability to create something effective, something clinical, but yet, also that gives you the spa experience and the clinical results that you need. Um, so these are the basis. We, we've talked a lot about the four pillars. Uh, those of you that have had the uh, CDP class that have been certified, you, we've done a lot of uh, this on Zoom. We cover the, the four pillars as a, as a means to understand where and how ingredients are selected, how the formulas uh, have to uh, put be put together and perform at a certain level so that you have the ability to use it in your practice and not miss anything else or, or leave any money on the table because people will walk in from all walks of life. Some want the spa experience. Some need clinical results because they're suffering from pigmentation or they're suffering from acne or acne scars. Um, some want to make sure that there's something behind the formulas or just not, you know, kind of like just fluff, that there's definitely some science behind it. Um, and obviously they don't wanna completely uh, ignore the fact that things are, are transdermally absorbing. So people are demanding organic um, ingredients just like they do with their food, their juices, uh, organic sheets, you name it. I mean, everything is really kinda has been moving in that direction for the last 12 years, but now, um, it's almost a mandatory uh, element of having any skincare regimen or formulas or skincare products to make sure that they're adequately addressing the demands and the, the request of your, your clientele. Okay, so I wanna add anything at this point before we get started. Um, Okay. That was good. So we got a good uh, 15, 16 plus questions that we want to go through. These are all from you guys. And these are questions that when I looked at them, I'm like, wow, I mean, this, this is what we really need to talk about because these are, these are questions that you need come Tuesday morning when you open your door and you see your first, your first client. Um, and again, we're going to weave in some of the ingredients and some of the points that we want to bring into the, the, uh, the equation. Um, but like I said earlier, whether you suggested these questions or not, it's going to be, you're going to have an affinity with these questions and the answers because you're doing exactly the same thing everyone else here is doing. I think it's just going to bring in a, a, a sense of um, understanding that it is also going to address and acknowledge some of the questions that you all have. So um, we're gonna get started. Uh, Tasha's gonna read the question. 
and I'm going to respond to it kind of like an interview type of thing so that it, it, it flows better. Uh, and it's not just us just throwing out information out to you guys. So okay. go ahead. I'll take it away. So a client recently had surgery to remove a large non-malignant malignant tumor in her right ear. What therapy do you suggest to heal the scar tissue? Also knowing that you're in the process of reformulating the DNA sunscreen, because it is so rich in plant oils, wouldn't this be a great therapy for healing scars? Okay, did everyone hear the question? Yes. Okay. So from the get-go, uh, we, we used to have a, a rule of thumb that if anyone had surgery, anyone had any kind of invasive therapies, uh, whether it be like a you know, uh, a very deep peel, uh, any kind of uh, anything removed, uh, any surgical intervention. We had a rule of thumb, when the stitches come out, um, DNA comes in, right? And so uh, with peels, we're gonna cover that a little bit later, but this question is specifically to removal. Uh, it, it's in, uh, in reference to removal of, of tissue, uh, of growth, uh, obviously there's, there's probably gonna be some stitches. And so we wanna make sure that the body has an ability to acknowledge the, 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 the stress that happened, uh, stops the, the, the bleeding, uh, things don't look like they're infected, and then the healing process starts. So when you have any invasive procedures, uh, whether they're, they'll, they're you know, medically induced or they are cosmetically induced, it, it is still a trauma, right? So we, we tend to think of a lot of things that we do on a daily basis as controlled uh, procedures uh, or controlled traumas, whether it be lasers or microdermabrasions or peels or dermaplaning or any of these things that are your disturbing the acid mantle, you're disturbing the subcutaneous um, uh, tissue, you're stimulating it, you're removing it, you're doing something. But ultimately the body has the last word in what it's and how it's gonna heal itself, how it's gonna translate this, this new communication that happened on the skin. Um, and in some cases when there's levels of, of inflammation that are high, autoimmunes, or there are even medications involved, uh, ultimately, you want to wait to make sure that whoever's doing this, uh, a doctor, a nurse, or an aesthetic licensed aesthetic practitioner, has a really good feel for what has happened and how the body's responding. So in this case, a uh, malignant or non-malignant um, growth was removed uh, somewhere around the ear. And so the protocol is typically wait a few days. If there are stitches, wait till the sti stitches are removed. Wait until the doctor clears the, uh, the lesion as it not being infected. Uh, there's no visible swelling or discharge or anything like that. At that point, you have a clear green light to move forward uh, using some of the light moisture, uh, light cleansers like a cream of nectar. Um, but the thing you want to make sure and you put in the, the, the products or the formulas that are that are very, very um, uh, healing. In this case, the signaling factors are important. Uh, the Zen therapies are gonna be important. Um, and as these are the big healers, right? And so once the healing is completely done, uh, it has, uh, the tissue has reestablished itself. Um, it's not swollen. Uh, there's gonna be either a scar or a keloid or some pigmentation. This is how the body eventually patches it up, right? If you're, if it's Patrick four, five or higher, uh, you're probably gonna have either a keloid, you're gonna have some pigmentation, and in which case these particular uh, conditions have to be then uh, addressed a little bit differently. So if you have hyperpigmentation, uh, we obviously have to use the sunscreens we have to use uh, the signaling factors are amazing for pigmentation. Um, and then I would also suggest to use the, um, uh, some of the oral hyperpigmentation, the, uh, the uh, Dermaclear. Dermaclear, along with vitamin C uh, to kind of just systemically allow the pigmentation to just fade out. Um, 
then you can get into your vitamin A's. And if there is any kind of scar or keloid, you wanna make sure you're doing a nice massaging to break up the scar tissue, okay? Fitzpatrick fives, <laughs> fours, these are your Hispanics, African-Americans, Native Americans, uh, Indian, uh, Indians uh, from India, uh, Middle Easterners. Um, we tend to throw more pigment and create scar tissue, right? So these are the ways that you can, we can deal with that. Once that's established, you can use uh, things like macrodermabrasion along with um, the vitamin A. Uh, you can use the vitamin C crystals to, to make sure that the uh, collagen and the pigment, and then now you're dealing with scarring uh, to make sure that uh, whether there's pigmentation or scarring that that gets alleviated and then kind of just restores itself to an even uh, pigmentation. Uh, no inflammatory uh, conditions, no keloids, none of that stuff. Um, if you have uh, Fitzpatrick three or less, you're, you're dealing possibly more with um, the opposite of a keloid, which is now a, a hypo um, scarring, which is more of an indentation. Uh, and in this case, you have to speed up the production of collagen, uh, essential fatty acids. So in this case, you would really, um, work with the uh, booster drops, you would work with uh, the vitamin A's, uh, you would work with the signaling factors, and of course, a little bit of sunscreen. Um, so basically, the stitches come off, DNA comes in, uh, working with a lot of the deposits that you wanna bring into that, that localized area. Okay, anything you wanna to add to that? Um, I <clears throat> on my Instagram, I shared a photograph of a gentleman whose face was burned in a pizza oven. And it was in Austin, Texas. So one of our accounts in Austin, um, the owner ran over uh, our home version, the Signal Plus, and his skin healed phenomenally. So the, the first line of defense, absolutely, I agree, is, is the, the, the most, you know, that packs the most punch, the most powerful for healing and collagen production is the frozen products. So um, but that picture is on my Instagram and you're welcome to, to check it out. Um, we do obviously like for the skin to have healed a little more, um, a little more than when they started <laughs> because <laughs> you put it right on. It's not antimicrobial. Um, so we do have to be careful with that, but, um, yeah, it's phenomenal. That's the strong medicine. So you're welcome to, um, to share video, um, the Instagram photos, as long as I've credited somebody. Um, then credit them. So, yeah. Okay. I hope that answers the questions to any kind of uh, surgical removal. Um, and again, it goes in alignment with scarring, uh, hyperpigmentation, um, vitiligo, which is the opposite, which is hypopigmentation. Uh, this is more of an autoimmune with some. Um, uh, mold or, or fungus or even yeast components to it. Um, I have addressed that a lot in my practice with a great deal of success. Um, but from a topical perspective, um, you would just deal with it the same way. You just have to make sure that with vitiligo, you understand that some of these people need to get off sugar. They, they need to get off uh, any kind of gluten. Uh, any kind of inflammatory uh, stimulus has to be removed because the immune system is just creating an autoimmune uh, response that is attacking the melanocytes. And where it's usually in areas where there's heavy friction, like in the groin area, in the uh, armpit area, the hands, the knees, uh, is typically where you see that. Um, and so uh, the immune response to it has to be calmed down and it has to be sort of restored to a normal state. So uh, no different than an autoimmune with say rheumatoid or diabetes where the immune system is actually attacking the beta cells of the pancreas. And so the ability to create insulin is no longer there. Um, psoriasis is not immune. I mean, there's an autoimmune, autoimmune, autoimmune stuff, but vitiligo is the same thing with a component to either heavy metals, but mostly what I see is, is a fungus or a yeast or what we call candida, 
with that. So if anyone presents with that or anyone says, hey, do you know anything that could help with Vitilago? It's the first thing you do, you know, get rid of the three white devils, which mm -hmm. are sugar, dairy, wheat. Well, we all need to do that anyway. <laughs> but, you know, just yeah. to avoid, you know, coming into yeah. having that situation. But, but you know, when yeah. you're dealing with inflammatory anything, you know, whether it's rosacea, whether it's, you know, uh, psoriasis, uh, there's an inflammatory component to that process. So you want to make sure that those things are, are talked about because no one else is talking about it. I mean, unless these guys, you know, your clients go to see a holistic, a good uh, alternative practitioner, they'll hear it, but otherwise they won't. So um, short of putting them on flagell or diflucan for, for any kind of mold or fungus, which then creates other issues, uh, they're not going to be addressed. So any kind of inflammatory conditions, you want to make sure that uh, you address that, along with fat fats, which we'll get into a little bit longer. All these additions. All these exciting. Yeah. Asthma fellows, but if they decide fellows should be addressed. So incredible, all these things. Either you give us a co-advertise that you have a hard job, you're active, you're active, you're active, you're active. Somebody's got something going on there. If you can just mute if your... If you guys can mute, yeah, yeah. please. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, when And just to go back to real quick, um, microneedling, obviously, in the this for this for deeper scars, it is a numbers game. So with DNA, we're getting a lot of collagen. We're getting more than any topical can ever provide. 71% um, fibroblast activity in the signal. And then of course, it's going to add up with our peptides, it adds up with our peels, it adds up. But if it's very, very deep, um, absolutely, you know, incorporating microneedling with it if you're allowed in your state, which apparently in California, we're allowed now. Mm. Um, looking more into that. So hyperpigmentation for Hispanic skin tone when it's just a few spots, what do you recommend when someone wants a quicker, more budget-friendly option than six to 10 sal treatments weekly? Well, and does the Dermaclear tend to make skin worse before it gets better? Sun has been on it for rosacea and just finished a bottle, but it's but still has it and has some new blemishes. Okay, so obviously I think we're referring to uh, post-inflammatory agnetic pigmentation in this case um, with active acne. So, and teenagers, I'm assuming it's a teenager. Uh, the mother's talking about the son uh, or, you know, young adult. Um, hormones are, again, all over the place, right? That's, that's a factor. The other factor is probably his diet. Uh, I just mentioned oils. Um, a lot of people pay a lot of attention to the things that are obvious, like sugars and dairy and gluten, for instance, yes, those, those are inflammatory. However, the one thing that I'm starting to really pay close attention to that is on my radar for the last couple of years is the bad oils, okay? And these are very, very, very important. No one talks about them. Uh, no one has said anything about them, but the really, really tough clients with, with or, or cases with acne, we gotta get them off bad oils. So what are bad oils? Basically anything that comes in a package or a box, when you walk into the health food store or the, 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 the grocery store, you got the produce section on the right hand side, which is 80% of the time. Uh, and that's about 10% of the whole store. The rest of the store is like a morgue, right? Things are dead. Things are uh, stabilized the last years. Uh, they have nothing about them that are alive or enzymes, and they're full of bad oils. Uh, that's number one. Number two, if people are eating out a lot, I don't care if it's the most expensive restaurant in the world. I don't care if it's Taco Bell. They're not using organic, virgin, cold pressed olive oil. Too expensive. <laughs> to make your food, okay? It just, it's not. Especially these days, it's not. So they're using things like canola oil, they're using things like safflower oil, they're using palm oil that has been heated and heated and heated over and over and over and over. 
So by the time you get it, it is completely and absolutely a free radical uh, offender at every level of your body. First of all, it is broken down, it is rancid, it is denatured. You cannot break it down, period, okay? This is going to really create a cascade of oxidative uh, stress. Uh, the liver is going to have a hard time with it, um, and it's going to start backing, backing up, okay? Because these oils just don't go anywhere. They hang out, and usually they get trapped in the liver. The liver has a hard time with them. Uh, the amount of enzymes necessary to negotiate them are going to be spent very, very soon. So um, make sure that that is also covered. So now people say, well, what's the best oil to cook with? Well, it's always going to be olive oil and avocado oil. Okay, period. You know, how about that? No. How about this? No. How about that oil? No. Stick with those two. Okay. Olive oil has been used for thousands of years. And avocado is a kind of like a new player in the uh, in the game, but it does have a high heat uh, tolerance, uh, a little higher than than olive oil. But never never overcook your food. Period. You know, never. You know, you're gonna if you're cooking with olive oil. Period. You can get cheap olive oil, uh, reasonable that's organic, uh, virgin, cold press, and unless you're really frying something for a long period of time, you're going to be fine with olive oil, okay? Um, so the fat oils are going to be important. Even before I even discuss anything about skincare, anything about, you know, products, I'm going to really find out where this kid is eating, what he's eating, um, before I even suggest anything else. So typically, you know, they're going to be either eating, you know, cafeteria food, they're going to be eating fast food, uh, and they may possibly have a meal at home a day, right? But then that meal could be Cheerios. It could be Lucky Charms. It could be, you know, different mm -hmm. things. Veganism is really, really hip these days with, you know, teenagers, college students. But they consider vegan wine and beer and French fries and, and cake and potato chips. These are all vegan foods, right? But yet they're, they're packed with bad fats and gluten and other things. They may also engage in eating uh, substitute uh, foods that have basically 80% gluten in them. That's what they're made from or, or pea protein. Again, these things are completely denatured um, and can't break down. So when it comes to very, very stubborn agnaic cases, you have to really go into that field of no bad oils, no sugar, no dairy, no gluten, lots of water, and you got to start eating veggies, and you got to start eating good fats, and you got to start eating things that are actually food. What do you think about coconut oil? Um, coconut oil is, is, is okay. It's a little denser uh, in nature. Um, I think that if you use it sparingly, it's going to be okay. Uh, but when it comes to acne, I think it's you're better with uh, avocado and olive oil, just because mm -hmm. it's it, it is easier on the liver, if you will. Uh, all my pay, all my clients, patients that are having high cholesterol, I get them off coconut oil. Now coconut is everywhere now. I mean, you have coconut chips, you have coconut this, you have coconut desserts, coconut ice cream. I mean, there's coconut everything now, right? And it's not bad. It's better than the alternative, but when you're having a lot of saturated fats uh, and you have a, a liver that is not quite functioning 100%, over time, it will create a little more um, strain on it as well. So coconut oil for acne is, is not a good choice, in my opinion, for now. Um, as far as protocols are concerned, obviously, we have uh, the MediClear wash, which is the thing to really kind of work with the skin to, to really kind of balance the oil pr production. Uh, when you have a, a backed up liver, you have an overreaction of, of, of sebum production because it's a way to detox the liver, right? Skin and liver are like brother and sister, brothers or whatever, they help each other out. This is why when someone's having a toxic liver effect, they usually have a rash, uh, they have uh, something going on in the skin. 
because the skin is where the body's going or the liver is going to dump some of the, the, the toxins. Um, it's sort of like a holding tank. It's a buffer zone. Um, and in some ways, it's actually a better way to do it than to send it into the bloodstream and do something else. The kidneys, um, the spleen, uh, the skin is a, a better choice. Unfortunately, we are in the business industry. We don't want anything awful in the skin, right? Nothing that looks bad. Hives, rashes, acne, boils, anything like that we don't want. However, when people say, you know, I've had this rash uh, when I got um, exposed to X, Y, Z, good. I'd rather it be your, your skin and not your brain. I'd rather be your skin and not your kidneys, but now we have to figure it out. So the skin is, is, is a way for the liver to have a little bit of a reprieve, to have a channel of elimination, and to have a way where the body can actually bring it to your attention that something's obviously not right. Okay. Um, you can talk a little bit about protocols if you would like. Protocols regarding, well, this person had, um, I think issues with blemishes and rosacea. So we do have the rosacea protocol on our website um, and the acne protocol, I believe under tips and tricks. So mm -hmm. make sure when you go on our website, you click under um, training and print out those tips and tricks because there's extra protocols there. And I know they're in the manual as well, but incorporating, as, as Dr. Aguilar has always said, the Dermaclare is huge. We have to clean the liver when we're dealing with the skin and particularly mm -hmm. rosacea, acne, hyperpigmentation. Um, it's beautiful because you're, you are helping to clear their skin, but you're also helping them for their life and their health and livelihood. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing. So, um, and then obviously the Oceana, the, um, the, cream of nectar and the Zen therapy are the protocols for the rosacea as the priority. And then incorporating the acne, as long as the rosacea is, um, you know, subsided, then usually you're going to see the clearing of the acne as well. So mm -hmm. they're kind of going hand in hand because of the, the dysfunction of the liver. And we do talk about that in that protocol and, and why, um, everything gets so haywire with the skin with rosacea. So please look that over. Yeah, some of the, the other part of this question was, um, what's, a, what's a budget friendly option other than six or 10 cell treatments weekly? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best things to do is control the active mm -hmm. acne first, okay? I know she's talking about Hispanic skin, which is, you know, Middle Eastern, which is also, you know, Native American. Uh, India, Pakistani, uh, and some of, also some of the African American skin. Um, you, you know, you need to control the acne first, and that is again the inflammatory oils, the inflammatory foods, um, and to make sure that they're getting actual food into their skin. Uh, one of the ways to really control it on a daily basis is by using the MediClear pads. That's one of the real great products that we have for that. Um, it's a tyrosinase inhibitor, so you're constantly introducing inhibition to the pigmentation and also disinfecting the skin um, with some malic acid, salicylic acid, and some of the other good stuff in there. Uh, instead of using alcohol, I use vodka, organic vodka in there. Um, so you're disinfecting because a lot of times the kids are touching their face, they're, 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 you know, their hygiene is not the best thing, um, nor do they have any attention on that. They go play, you know, pee and then have to run to their next class. And the last thing they, they have to worry about is, is washing their face. So having a little bit of those pads and a little plastic lunch box um, sandwich bag and just kind of doing a quick little thing uh, suffice. Um, but again, making sure that those, the, the acne, the, the active acne is controlled, then you're dealing with the pigmentation, uh, which could be from like six months ago right? They had a, a breakout and that breakout is highly pigmented because it was an injury. No different than if you cut your hand or you bruised your leg. You're, if you're a Hispanic or a Fitzpatrick four or higher, you're going to have some pigment. It's just kind of what happens. Um, and then you deal with um, bringing those, those down with um, some of the other protocols that we have for pigmentation. So the Dermaclear is an absolute from the get-go with vitamin uh, C, that's gonna bring down and, and help the liver and it's a tyrosinase inhibitor. 
Um, the other thing that I also noticed that I forgot to mention is a lot of the kids with uh, active acne or severe acne or tough cases of acne, they're very nervous, they're stressed. So there's a lot of cortisol being flooded into the, the system, right? So you can do a lot of work here and prevent some of these sebums and some of the, the other things from going, but it's no different than having sweaty hands, right? It's like the body's always in a fight or flight situation. So therefore, the body's gonna produce more pigment for protection, it's gonna produce more sebum for protection because there's a lot of cortisol going on, you know? I mean, there's cases when they walk into my office and they're nervous and they came in clean showered and then within 20 minutes, they actually start producing BO because they're so nervous, right? Their skin is as nice, they just wash their face on the way here and 15, 20 minutes later, they're shinier than a strobe light in oil because they're, 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 they're stressed, right? And they shouldn't be stressed, but they stress about so many things, right? Hair? I'm too, I'm too short. I'm too, you don't have to do laundry if you're in a hurry today. I'm too tall. Sorry, <laughs> Lori. <laughs> These are my parents. Oh my God, I just realized who my parents are. On and on and on, right? So there's so many things to be worried about. And so, again, it's a lot easier to control their, their diet, believe it or not, and have them take a few things, have a little protocol going and trying to control their stress because there's a lot, lot more stress. And the other thing to consider is the mask, right? We've been masked now for a couple of years. Uh, we're breathing bacteria, we're breathing whatever else gets accumulated in their um, waste and it's rubbing on our face. We're constantly moving it around. Um, so that also puts a burden not only on the face, but also on the liver. So these are all things that are, we're having to kind of deal with all along. So the, to make it more of a budget-friendly option, my suggestions are to do the Dermaclear with vitamin C and the, um, the, the pads, the... Uh, well, the Medipads. The Medipads, thank you. And uh, you're getting salicylic acid there, you're getting sebum uh, regulation there, you're getting a tyrosinase inhibitor there, and focus on their diet. I know that's, that's a tough thing. Uh, someone mentioned um, the catalyst enzymes. The reason why I introduced and formulated the catalyst is because of the same reason that people are just not eating real food, right? Um, we were so far away from going out and buying the food for that day at the open air market or Mercado or the, the farmer's market and bringing it home and cooking it. And then tomorrow doing the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. So a lot of the food that we're eating, it's not just denatured, but it's also just really empty because it was picked green. If it's a vegetable or fruit, it was picked green because it had, it had to make its way from Chile or Mexico or whoever was grown green and then sits in the shelf for a week, and then you buy it, and then it sits on your shelf for maybe a day or two or a week, and then ripens away from the source. It ripens away from the vine, away from the soil, away from the trees. So those nutrients, those, those enzymes that actually make the fruit or the veggie ripen are gone. So we eat food uh, that I like to call the, the green harvest because it, was, it wasn't picked red, or yellow or nice and juicy, right? It was picked green. So even though sometimes we eat good food, it's still lacking a lot of enzymes, which contributes to liver issues, acne issues, inflammatory issues. And so you've heard a lot about inflammation is the cause of all disease. And for the most part, yes, that's, that's true because inflammation is your immune system being overactive. That's all it is, whether it's a allergy, whether it's, you know, swollen joints, whether it's uh, rosacea, whether it's any kind of autoimmune, this is your immune system being a little ticked off for whatever reason, right? So to say that inflammation is a cause of all disease, it's not no longer enough. We need to say why. Why is it that we're getting inflammatory diseases? You know, I think of my parents and their parents and autoimmune was probably nothing they even heard of. But now it's almost 
super common, right? Everyone knows or has had some sort of an inflammatory condition. So it's very, very important to, to, to understand that the reason why some of these inflammatory conditions are happening is because the things that we're breathing, the air we're breathing, the mask we're wearing, the food we're eating is lacking enzymes to break itself down, to allow itself to actually break down to its smallest unit, whether it's a a carbohydrate, a protein, a fiber, a fat. And in return, these things in, are absorbed and then re-categorized um, as, or repurposed as units of energy, if it's a sugar, if it's a carb, or units of building blocks of our skin or bones or brain, everything, right? And so some people are in, a, in such a negative deficit that they're not even producing collagen anymore. They're not producing elastin anymore. They're not producing new cellular structures because of all the inflammatory conditions that are going on. So the enzymes, the catalyst is exactly the name of it. It's, it's the purpose is to be a catalyst for the things that we're eating that then it can be repurposed to something that's either gonna give us energy or building blocks of our own body. But Equally as importantly is that it's not going to hang out in our liver and create even more toxicity, which then in turn creates inflammation. So enzymes are like these little Pac-Mans, right? That there's specific enzymes for specific things. Uh, there's enzymes that are specialized for fat, for carbs, for fiber, for protein, and some are even specialized for uh, waste. So if we eat something that has bad oils, for instance, right? And if you're in tune with your body, you're gonna feel it. You're not gonna feel 100% in an hour or two. You're gonna feel a little sluggish. You might get a headache. Uh, next morning, your hands might be a little, you know, might hurt a little bit, whatever. Whatever way your body responds to it. If you have rosacea, it might be even worse. Um, if you have fatigue issues, you might be really tired. Um, if you have uh, GI issues, you might be spending a few more days, a few more hours in the bathroom, who knows, right? Or the opposite, where you start skipping days because things are really backed up. The enzymes are basically for that, to break down the food, to break down the waste, to break down the inflammatory cycle. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you have any kind of inflammatory skin issues, you're having an inflammatory response, usually due to lack of enzymatic activity. And there's also the possibility that, I mean, using transdermally toxic ingredients separate from, you know, people are cherry pickers. And as estheticians, we're always having to kind of navigate mm -hmm. what they're doing on their own that could be causing inflammatory responses as well. So it's really important to have clarity and transparency with your with your clients just to make sure they're not doing something crazy on the side like i got this stuff on amazon and i mean it's just good to know exactly what they're what they're into you'd be surprised how many people are doing so many things it's 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 uncanny i mean the reason why i'm still in the trenches at least twice a week seeing people is because they're teaching me what is really going on out there you know they come in and go have you seen this new product what do you think or I tried something and it really helped. Well, what is it? Uh, and so I make all these notes. Um, I'm able to see where something is actually working, something is not working, something is not living up to its claims, and some things are. And so, for instance, over the years, we know, like for instance, you know, there's thousands of um, tens of thousands of, of medical journals and literature on the effects of fish oil and the benefits of fish oil. Same thing with you know, when a new thing comes out, I know when 25, 30 years ago when melatonin was supposed to be the anti-aging miracle of the century. And then after 20, 30 years, we know it helps you sleep. <coughs> it helps with, you know, brain activity. So, okay, at least we know that now. But back then people were taking it as, uh, as candy because, you know, uh, they were convinced they, it turned the clock back 25 years. Well, that's not the case, right? Um, chondroitin sulfate and uh, glucosamine sulfate, right? That kind of came in around the same time. And guess what? That actually holds a lot of water. There's millions and millions of people that have taken it with great results, right? So we can bank in that. And that is exactly what research is. You find out what it does, 
if it can be duplicated over and over and over and over with the same exact responses and outcome, then that becomes a bridge that then you can stand on and then expand from that, right? And so some of these, these bridges came only so far and to say that, okay, melatonin is supposed to be X, Y, Z, you jumped off and you landed on <laughs> the dirt. Well, we, that, that's the same over and over. So then this is as far as this bridge goes and this is what we know now. Uh, same thing with other ingredients with, 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 um, with skin, right? There's flavors of the month every every time. There's there's this new ingredient. There's this new ingredient, and and honestly, you know, they come and they go. And after a year, or two, or three, or decade, you realize that it was only good for an expensive ingredient that people were taunting, but it really didn't do much. So when we suggest anything or we consider an ingredient, we've already done our homework for you. We already know, for instance, progesterones are going to be something that as the environment becomes more and more degraded, um, you know, uh, more and more people are, are taking pharmaceuticals, more and more people have been uh, vaccinated, um, more and more stress on the bodies, there's going to be less and less ability for the body to heal and more need for um, legitimate deposits that we can have access to, whether it be transdermal, orally, and other lifestyle changes and habits that we can actually bank on that they're going to do a lot of work. So I hope that answers that question after 20 minutes. Well, honestly, it leads almost to the next question. Okay. So it's perfect. Um, what difference does uh, it make in your skin when you quit sugar? I'm sure they're mm -hmm. talking about glycation and seeing evidence of that on the skin. Um, so we could, maybe you could address glycation specifically. Um, and then what is the best diet for healthy skin? So um, best supplements for healthy skin. And by the way, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a lot, um, but uh, best protocol for thyroid issue, creating incessantly dry skin. Um, and of course, hormones can play into that. And what is the best protocol for laxity of the neck and jaw? What is the right. best home care for rosacea? <laughs> okay, so rosacea we covered, and that's that protocol is in the um, that you can you can ask, access it on our website under training. Um, but yeah, so we'll address glycation. Let's address the, yeah. Let's address the diet and the sugar and glycation, right? And is it you know if we're doing a good job or if you if if you find that this is working, give us a th thumbs up. This is information that is it's helpful for you and in, in, in your practice and what you're doing. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay. So we talked a little bit about sugar. We talked about gluten. We talked about, you know, different things. Now refined sugar is probably the, the, the worst offender when it comes to when we think about sugar, right? Uh, it's completely absent of all enzymes. It's completely absent of any fiber. It's completely absent from anything that it actually came from, right? So you can have cane sugar, like cane, you know, when we were kids, uh, we, I grew up in a Hispanic neighborhood and, and, and we used to make fun that the, the, the rich kids had an ice cream uh, truck that went by and we had the little guy with the uh, little card oh, with the little uh, guy. Ice, uh, <laughs> uh, ice and like whatever paint. And then, oh, by the way, we also have sugar cane, one sugar cane, because I was like almost free. So we always had sugar cane. So we would grab a, a sugar cane about that long, about that big, and we just munch on it and, and, <laughs> And you know, none of us had cavities, none of us had like, you know, hyperactivity of all because it came from the source. Does that make sense? It is in its proper envelope, it's in its natural state, it is not bleached, it is not processed, it is not preserved. Now it's GMO'd. Now it's, you know, what it is. However, when people think about sugar, there's many, many forms of sugar, right? People think that, for instance, agave is, is great, or honey is great, or molasses is good. Um, what else is good? Uh, Pure maple syrup. Maple syrup. I mean, these are all, I mean, you can look at something, and, and if you focus on one thing, you can make an argument for how good or how bad it is, right? But you got to look at the whole thing, right? And this is what I want you to really kind of start to think about things. Um, when you really start looking at things and you start analyzing things or you start considering things, you look at the whole picture. You don't look at one thing. Um, unfortunately, research has always been where whoever's doing the research 
has a sort of like a, a, a the crosshairs on something that he or she or that group or that university wants to prove. So they're going to go hard on that. And a lot of the stuff that that they're omitting, they're just not talking about it. They're focusing on why, you know, certain things are good for you, right? So on the opposite scale on that, I want you to start thinking about the whole picture. So when we think about sugar, consider that sugar comes in different colors and different grades. For instance, uh, we do know that if we look at sugar as a carbohydrate and you look at molasses, you're gonna go, oh my God, it has 60 grams of sugar. That's not a good thing, right? If you look at maple syrup, you go, oh my God, it has 20 grams of sugar. That can't be good. But then you look at things like sugar and it may have 10 grams of sugar and you say, well, that must be better, right? What you have to consider is this, what effect does that compound have on your, on, your, on your body? The minute it touches your mouth, right? So you have to consider molasses for, for example, right? Molasses has, it's rich in B vitamins, it's rich in minerals, uh, it's rich in enzymes, it has a, a whole slew of other beneficial uh, constituents that sugar is just part of. So, if you wanted to have something sweet, if you wanted to bake with something, if you wanted to sweeten something with it, some of the better choices, based on those bigger picture, broad considerations are gonna be your maple syrups, um, your molasses, uh, that's- Do you like Manuka honey? Yes, but the thing about honey is that it has very little fiber, if not at all. Mm. So it, it, it doesn't slow down the peak of, of the, the blood sugar fluctuations. And that's another thing to worry about, too. Um, so, for instance, because molasses and maple syrup are more complex, they don't have a direct increase of blood sugar, which is a, a high glycemic effect versus a low glycemic effect, right? So what happens in the body when you have a really strong or very heavily refined or processed sugar is that it, the glycemic effect is really high. So to give you an example, you, you have um, simple syrup in your margarita, right? Okay, so I did a good thing because I'm, I'm drinking tequila and I'm not drinking wine. That's a better thing for you, for all of you that know me, they know I drink tequila, not wine or beer because it's distilled, it's just the actual um, alcohol, the agave, and then the heavy particles are left behind. So it's a lot easier. There's nothing heavy about it like whiskey or beer or wine. These, 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 these heavy particles are the ones that really are, are toxic. However, anything that is taken away from the source, including alcohol from agave, is highly glycemic because it doesn't have the rest of the formula or the west of the, the, the precursors or the envelope to be a, a, a complete natural ingredient. So then you put simple syrup on it and now that glycemic is really high. So when we think about sugar and we think about aging, these glycemic spikes and lows are creating this to happen in your metabolic uh, presentation or pr uh, process. According to a lot of the medical research that is coming out recently now, they're finding that inflammation and aging um, is caused, number one, by blood sugar fluctuations, okay? Which is kind of what, it's, a, it's congruent and it's in alignment with what I've been seeing over the last 25 years, you know, addressing people's health. Right so here. people think that, if they, if they don't eat or they fast, that that's good for them. Well, it is for some people, but for some people, it brings down their blood sugar way low and it causes those swings to happen. For some people, um, they eat a little bit of bread, they have a little coffee, and then they fast till dinner time. Well, that's not good either, because remember, you wanna keep your blood sugar like this and not up and down. And so what happens when those big swings happen, it causes an oxidative stress mostly of uh, stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, epinephrine. These are all stress coping hormones that create 
a, an inflammatory response along with the, with, the, with the sugar oxidative stress that actually attaches itself to small microscopic fibers of collagen and elastin, allowing them to create almost like a little bit of a scar tissue, right? And what it does in return, it prevents this turnover of new collagen, new elastin to look the way it used to look when we were 20, 18, 25 years old. Now it's more of a patch. It's more of a scar. It's tougher, it's heavier, and it's going to be weighing down with gravity, causing things to actually look more oh. like they're dropping, right? And so these little sort of fibers of, 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 of stress and um, scar tissue are known to be called glycation. And so sugar, people think sugar is the one, but sugar is, but it's typically the fluctuations of blood sugar, too high, too low. Um, one of the best ways to control that, and I've told people this all the time, um, smaller meals more often, okay? Low glycemic foods uh, that are in alignment basically with sort of paleo Mediterranean. So to answer the question, what's the best food, best diet, my opinion over the years, you can't be too extreme. You can't be carnivore. You can't be vegan, right? If you if you go extremes, they can be extremes for a short period of time for a therapeutic effect, not as a lifestyle change. You're going to run out of uh, reserves at a certain point. So, paleo, good sources of protein, good vegetable, low glycemic foods things that are alive, full of enzymes, um, you know, are where most of us are going to fit. Now, we're all different. We're all going to have certain sensitivities to certain things. Some people are very sensitive to nightshades. Some are sensitive to citrus. Some are sensitive to peanuts. These are all things that if you know your body, you're going to know what you feel better with or not, but still maintaining that sort of like buffer of paleo Mediterranean there. Now, with the awareness of these bad oils, sugar, gluten, and dairy. So to answer those questions as far as what's the best diet, that's, that's my up-to-date version on, on what people should actually be considering. Now, the umbrella and all that is, like I said, bad oils and meals that are not too large at one time, because otherwise your blood sugar is going to go up. Food that is organic, because people are like, well, fundamentally organic versus non-organic have the same nutritional value. Well, that might be true, minus all the chemicals you're ingesting. Glyphosate, <laughs> glyphosate. GMOs, glyphosate, things like that. So we're not talking about nutrition in general. I mean, we're not talking about nutrition. Yes, we are. We want the best nutrition, but we also don't need or want chemicals, poisons, pesticides, preservatives in our food. And that's another big one as well. And fish oil, right? I mean, we, we have an awesome fish oil. And so um, asking specifically best diet for healthy skin, <clears throat> that, can, that can be a game changer for a lot of people if they're deficient in fats. Well, they're deficient in fats because a lot of us aren't eating real fats. Okay, period. That's, that's number one. The fats that we are eating are not natural fats. They're denatured fats. So not only are we not eating real fats, we're accumulating bad fats. So one of a counter move to that would be having essential fatty acids, BHA, EPAs that are from a source that is tested with mercury. Uh, and again, uh, you know, you need to also it's not enough to test for, for mercury anymore. You need to check for nanoparticles of uh, plastics in the ocean because they're, it's full of it now. So these are all important things to consider. Um, not wait too long between meals because we don't want the blood sugar to go up or, or down. I tell people smaller meals, make a deposit every three, three and a half hours. If you reach the four hour, you've gone too far. You need to have something in there because you want to kind of do this little sort of, you know, pattern rather than do this, okay? Uh, you want to give your body the sweetest, most efficient uh, deal you can. Real food, no pesticides, small amounts, 
uh, often. Um, and, um, and I think if we stay within that, everything else uh, will, will improve. And I'll just address glycation on the skin, like if they're observing glycation. Um, obviously, we're, you're going to have a conversation about diet. And then if it's extreme, they can, and are open, they could see a naturopath and maybe see what they could do to, to negotiate that. But of course, we have things that clean the blood, like the, the natto kinase, the natto sol yeah, that has natto, natto kinase in it. Um, we have the enzymes, we have the fish oil. They get, from your standpoint, we do have things to negotiate the internal aspect as well as a conversation about their diet. And I know there's better con kind of informed, um, uh, informed uh, breakdowns online of what you can ask um, different interview when you're interviewing a client for the first time, find out what they're on, find out what supplements they take, what their diet's like. Um, and then as far as glycation on the skin, when people are using transdermally toxic products, um, it's going to diminish the skin's collagen and elastin, and you're going to see more glycation from even that or what looks like glycation. So using the entire DNA line, because you're using all the precursors to collagen, you're using herbs that have been known to cure disease throughout time, things like milk thistle. And I mean... It, you're you're actually you're actually cleaning the the cells and you're detoxifying them at the same time as modulating its immune system so any pro like you don't even need a protocol just get them on dna period even the cleansers are medicine yeah i mean that's a that's a good point because anything that your body comes in contact with i mean there's dermatones i, I talk about dermatones in, in our certification classes and these are um, colonies and clusters of nerve endings that are in our, our skin. These are there to actually assess the environment, whether it's temperature, whether it's pressure, whether it's uh, toxicity, uh, you know, something came through your skin that's a, a, a poison. Uh, it could be, you know, in the industrial field, it could be uh, a bee sting, it could be you know, UV lights and UV, you know, uh, UVB uh, rays, all these things your nervous system knows about and it warns your brain, the computer that then controls everything as a response from that point. Is it gonna be more pigment? Is it gonna be more sebum? Is it gonna be more sweat? Is it gonna be, um, you know, hormones released? I mean, all these things are controlled because your brain doesn't have a way to sense it. It depends on the skin and the nervous systems on the skin to be able to then formulate a response. And we're in a constant communication with, with our environment. The temperature, you know, I talk about being in a room and someone walks in the room and if that person's extremely angry, you, you know they're angry just by the way they, they, they walk and they change the frequency and energy of that space. You know, you don't have to look at it to know that. Um, the vibrations are there. I mean, you have a guitar in one corner of the room and the guitar in the other corner of the room and you, you strum one guitar, it, 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 it strings at one particular note, the other guitar starts vibrating at the same note. And it's no different with us. We're in constant communication. So to Tasha's point, which I completely agree on and prescribe to is that Anything coming into our environment, particularly on our skin, is going to absorb, okay? Good, bad, or indifferent, the body will know. Inflammatory responses, autoimmune, it sets you up for all these different things. So even though we, we were using, or people are using very expensive skincare, they're, they're using these regimens, and they're constantly over a course of a week, a month, in years, you're accumulating, accumulating, accumulating these, these saturations that eventually turn into inflammatory or uncontrolled inflammatory responses. This could be in form of allergies, it can be in form of, you know, any autoimmune, headaches, dullness, fatigue, insomnia, you name it. These are all inflammatory results of our environment. That's just where we are. We have to read our ingredients on food and skincare, everything. Um, okay. Um, what order of, of applying DNA products is best for optimal absorption? Um, 
would the absorption be improved by applying products according to molecular structure? Wouldn't one apply, want to apply any products that contain oils last so that the absorption of products without the oil isn't hindered and get blocked by any oils which have a much larger molecule structure? Okay, that's a, actually a very good question because <clears throat> I think that the, the important thing to remember here is that DNA skin is one molecular structure if you take every formula, you take the lift confirm, that's one molecular structure, meaning every single ingredient in that formula has been married together. So the molecular structure of those things are, are married, right? Positive, negative, neutral. These are all categorized before all this occurs. So at the end of the day, when you're using a formula, it doesn't matter if this is signal, the vitamin A, uh, the uh, cream of nectar, uh, the lightning serum, the acne uh, boosters, or any of these things, the blemish boosters, these are all already in a, in a single molecular structure, right? So they act very differently. Now, the end result of certain formulas versus other formulas, yes, the viscosity is different. The ingredients are different. So common sense would say, if you are doing a a treatment on someone, you want to make sure that you cleanse, um, you prep the skin for whatever other modality you're doing, then you cleanse again, and then you do your uh, therapeutic um, formulas first, and then you do your moisturizing second, and then you do your protective um, uh, layers last. And to some large effect, I, I still agree with that, only because you can remember those things. But from the beginning, we always say with DNA, you don't have to follow anything. Everything, you can put everything at one time in your hand, put it on the skin, and nothing bad's going to happen. Okay? So having said that, I always tell people, follow your gut right? If you're used to doing it this way, do it that way. If you want something that you're going to incorporate, then yes, do your cleansing, do your prepping, do your modalities, whatever that is, whether it's a peel, whether it's microdermabrasion, whether it's needling, whether it's, you know, a dermaplaning, whatever, that, whatever modality you like, oxygen, whatever it is, uh, you clean uh, the skin again, you do your therapeutic, like whether it be vitamin A, your signal, uh, your mask, you clean again, if, if it is a mask, and then you do all your deposits, whether it be the boosters, the moisturizers, um, and then you finish with you know, the sprayers. The one thing I do wanna tell you is all the moisturizers, um, including the eye cream, the uh, Lift and Firm, uh, the Oceanas, all the ones that are actually there to moisturize and heal and protect are concentrates. Everything in this, this line are concentrates, right? If you noticed that the ingredient deck on the back um, has very little water or no water at all, right? So we, there's a couple of things. The reason why that is, is because the concentrates without water are more stable. The second thing is that if we add water to the formulas, the way every other formula does, you have to add preservatives and your packaging has to be three to four ounces larger, which means more waste, right? We don't use secondary packaging, even though I'm sure it looks really pretty and it has a separate box and you know it's eye-catching. I get that. And believe me, there's times at three in the morning where I end up going, all right, we're going to have secondary packaging yeah. because <laughs> people are going to really be more attracted to it. It's going to sell it more, blah, 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 blah. You know, we can, we, and then I'm like, oh, God. And so there's this constant fight that goes on, you know, <laughs> first thing they open and throw in the trash and they, you know, and that's it. It's just like, it's, a, like it's a present. It, oh, yay. It's so psychological. And, 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 and I get it. You know, the perceived value <laughs> of that product goes through the roof. And from a marketing perspective, I get it. From a conscious perspective, I don't. So um, I still haven't done it. And I don't think we're gonna do that anytime soon, but it's just to kind of give you a little bit of the background story of what goes on all the time. Um, and so 
what happens is that every time you use a DNA product, you have to stretch it out. You have to activate it again because it's in a state of hibernation. It is stable. It is asleep until it gets the necessary moisture. And then it starts to bloom like a flower, right? Because the ingredients now have the medium to expand, to stretch, to communicate. So remember that you have to always use, even if it's just water, it's okay, right? As long as it's not water from the tap, but you have to have water or the floor bliss, the hydro blend, or a combination of water or those things just to bring it in, allow it to kind of breathe, expand, and then apply it. Now remember that regardless of the molecular structure, regardless of its small, large, medium, light, heavy, there's all these terms for molecular weight and, and, and densities and weights and measures, because it is a natural constituent in a one molecular format, it is going to absorb, okay? Um, so you have to remember that. This is why people say, well, you know, I put it on and I put it on and, and it's not like my other products where I put a little bit on and it's like, I can feel it. It's, it's, it's really what it's doing is just sitting on your face. It's not doing anything because it has dimethicones, it has silicones, it has other things that make it feel nice and makes it feel like you're hydrated, but you're not. And guess what? It's also tricking your brain to think that you have enough moisture so it's not producing any internal moisture. The moisture balance, the oil balance gets completely turned upside down, right? Wow. So when you have things that actually absorb, communicate, feed, these are resources and fundamental precursors to everything you need for collagen and elastin, uh, not freaking out your immune system. Now you're having something that is just like a meal, right? You're feeding your skin things that, that are actually going to affect in a positive way the next generations of how your skin's gonna look, age, recover, and not get inflamed. Because those are the things that we're really trying to do. When you really think about it, it is kind of interesting to think that we have so much attention on our face, right? We wash our face. We, we add moisturizer, we peel our face, we add makeup to our face, right? we, all these different things, right? And all of that, if you're not using the right stuff, you're either inducing a toxic state over time, inflammatory responses over time, and you're not feeding the skin what it needs. So as long as you're doing those steps and you're spending the money and you're doing the treatments and this is your vocation or this is your gift to the rest of the world, this is your profession, you need to start addressing some of these issues that some people are really not aware of. And so, you know, part of understanding where we are also gives you a sense of accountability and it gives you a sense of uh, being able to then train and educate your clientele on what's really important because a lot of times they think if it's pretty the packaging is nice it's over a hundred dollars it's got to be good right how deep do your protocols absorb doing it that way can they get through the dermis or know that you know the thing about saying certain things and not saying other things they're you know, you're getting into a whole other uh field of claims and if it does claim that you're going through the dermis now it becomes a prescription so in order for me not to say that and for you guys to be able to use it because it is something that you can use let's just say it penetrates enough and it penetrates uh to the point that your skin is going to be fed resources and nourishments and that it's going to have the necessary building blocks to perform the next generation of itself, okay? Um, I always use the example that a lot of the skin that I just see walking around, um, you know, obviously it's regenerating because otherwise it would just fall off, right? However, the ability to, re to regenerate in a certain way is, is compromised. Uh, the, the contractor, 
right? Understands how to build a house. But if he doesn't have the tools to build it, it just can't. It might be able to kind of put it together, but if he doesn't have a hammer, saw, and nails, it's not going to stick together. It's going to fall. But it doesn't mean he doesn't know how to do it. You know, every body, your body, my body, Tysha's bodies, the neighbor's bodies, the, the, the people in New Guinea's bodies, know how to regenerate, know how to do that. Whether they have the resources or they don't is a whole different story. Okay. So, so that's, that's that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> why is the cold mask called? Uh, so, uh, someone's computer's on. Hold on. Let me see if I can find. Can you guys? Oh, there it is. Okay. Found it. Um, okay. Why is the cold mask called signal pro peptide mask? I understand the peptide part, but does it also have the signal plus pro proteins in it? Yes. So, and that'll come back to our first question, I guess, because I wanted to kind of put those. Oh, okay, together. so we'll just, we'll pick that one back up. Um, let me skip that one because it's just. Can we go over low weight hyaluronic acid in Signal Plus? I have read several articles that state low weight HA is inflammatory. Would love to get your input. Okay, so this goes back to the same thing, right? The molecular structure of, of anything is just the, the size of the molecule, right? It's the, the shape, the size, the atomic weight. These are all different shapes and sizes. The most important thing to remember is that uh, you have to remember the origin of it. Where does it come from? Is it processed? Um, is it denatured in any way, regardless of its molecular size and weight? Getting back to the same example that I can tell you, if you have cold press virgin oil uh, as your main source of oil or avocado oil versus denatured canola oil, they're both oils, but yet one's dead and one's not. So it's the same example. We think about molecular weight of low weight versus larger weight. These are basically addressing different layers of skin. That's all it's doing, okay? It's allowing for the skin to have an easier pathway to, to get the hyaluronic acid to hold on to moisture because hyaluronic acid can hold at least 500 times its atomic weight and moisture. And so it doesn't do any good if the, the heavier weight is just on the skin, right? It's gonna you know, make you look dewy and moisture, but then the bottom layers are not. So the purpose of having different molecular weights is to give the skin, the different layers of the skin, the opportunity to be able to absorb it. That's all it is. The inflammatory response comes from the source of the, the, the hyaluronic acid, if it's been denatured, if it has any preservatives, just like anything. You, you absorb anything and, and the body and the skin understands hyaluronic acid and knows it has to be something it needs and wants, so it's gonna absorb it. But if it's, if it's a Trojan horse, and bringing in a lot of other things in there, then yes, there's gonna be inflammatory responses just like anything else. But hyaluronic acid shouldn't be a, an inflammatory response regardless, regardless of its atomic weight or structure. Okay. Um, hoping for an in-depth protocol knowledge for Jesner peel and peel protocols, combinations, layering techniques for specific skin conditions. Um, I, I don't know who that, that person would be, but um, I have a great um, Jesner peel video that goes through each layer process. So um, just reach out to us, whoever that was, and we're happy to kind of, I'm happy to share my Jesner videos. Um, but but as far a, as peel you, protocols yeah, go, over, over yeah, I'll do a quick overview. Um, as you guys know, we have three, three peels that can be used on a regular basis um, for aesthetics. I typically did peels weekly for a series and then I would back them off for monthly visits. Um, those incorporate lacto or glyco or sal. So it's, our lacto is, is organic um, milk kefir and milk. the fermentation or oat milk. No, what did goat you milk. say? Goat milk kefir. Yeah. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> um, it's the product of the fermentation, the yeah. fermented, um, and that's, uh, that's the moisturizing peel. Yeah. And then we have glycolic and it's, it's really more for fine tuning the uh, pores and um, anti-aging. 
but I mean, these can all be cocktailed together. So if I see somebody sensitive, but they've had peels and they want it to be a bit stronger, they've already had the lacto, I can combine those two. So just kind of bump it up a little because looking at the way that they feel, the, the um, results, basically you, 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 would, you could start with lacto if they're sensitive and then kind of acclimate them up to the sow for the more intense peel if, that, if that's what they're wanting. Because there are clients that, and we all know this, that if they don't feel it, you, you didn't do a good job. And so they let you know. <laughs> so they want to feel a little something. That's the sow. So what I can do is cocktail in a little bit of sow, um, even if it's not necessarily an acne issue, just to kind of give it a boost. Now, Jesner is a whole other animal when we do Jesner, unless we're doing just a spot peel, which I love. Okay. Um, unless we're doing a spot peel, which I love. And um, I have a few spot peels on my Instagram, um, DNA Skin Girl. Um, and you can these are from other accounts and you can see um the uh that you have the ability to just eradicate one specific spot or a couple if you don't want to if your client doesn't want to go through the full jesner layering process for example if i did a treatment on somebody and um let's say a regular peel and then they just had that one spot you know i might suggest that we go ahead and clean up that spot after the regular facial or treatment and go ahead and layer a few layers of the Jesner on. They still can't wash their face for 24 hours. And that protocol is obviously in the manual. Um, and then they're gonna see that spot lift out. It could take a couple, it depends on how deep the spot is. Obviously, you know, we wanna use the Dermaclare to make sure we're cleaning up those channels of the, the melanocytes and the tyrosinase, sending that signal from the liver to tell them to keep making that pigment over time. So incorporating it all together is important. But um, when we do the layered Jesner, that's just a Jesner that day. I, I don't like the idea of doing any other activity with it, extractions, anything, because ideally you would have cleaned them up and prepped them the, a few weeks before. Because if you're doing a seven, six, seven layer Jesner, that should just be what they do that day. You can pre-pill them, absolutely. I've had people do a mini microderm first and then they only end up getting on a couple of layers of the Jesner. It just depends on what works for you as a practitioner. Um, but please ask um, to see the videos if you really wanna see them in action um, because I know it can be complicated and, and understanding that our Jesner has, it incorporates antioxidants, resveratrol and lycopene. So they're healing the skin while it peels. So it gives you a little bit more insurance and assurance that it's not gonna to be too intense for, for them. Um, ideally, you did do a spot test, especially if you thought there were sensitivities. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, layering, you're absolutely able to layer the peels or cocktail them together. So that's absolutely fine. Um, they did ask about combinations for specific skin conditions. So. Again, um, the, the sal is going to go into more of the acne, but if you want something deeper, you can start acclimating them towards that and then to the Jesner, and that's going to be the ultimate for lifting um, problem skin issues. So, okay, we covered that guy. And then um, if multiple Jesners are needed to reduce pigmentation, how far apart would you recommend doing them? Well, it's case by case, yeah. right? I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, some people take a full two weeks to completely micro peel. Uh, the, the sheet peeling happens and they still kind of micro peel, micro peel, micro peel, and then it's done. Um, of course, you, you're a little better, you have a little bit more leeway and liberty to kind of spot uh, a dresser and things, uh, certain areas. So, you know, everyone's different, but for a rule of thumb, I would say two weeks. Yeah. yeah, and if they had like yeah. a really thin skin and, and they had a sensitive, difficult time at all, obviously you, you just, you know, maybe add another week, but it's really is case to case. So, um, and again, that's, that's a question about reducing pigmentation. So remember, we do have the, the lightning products as well, and we have the Dermaclear. So um, it can be odd for a lot of estheticians to talk about internal supplements, but once you get into it and you understand, you, you, feel, um, you feel more confident about actually talking about supplements and diet 
And he's amazing at helping us do that by educating us in these videos. Does the cold mask have the Signal Pro serum in it? And should it, should I also apply the serum first for better results? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the, the frozen you're saying, right? No, that's the, um, the mask, I think. There's well, they said, mask. should they apply the serum first before? So when you're using, yeah, the Signal, the Signal Pro serum in it. There's a cold mask. Yeah. Have the Signal Pro serum in it, yes. Um, I mean, but should I apply the serum first for better results? If you're, if they're talking about the Signal Pro, the, the cryo, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I would apply that. That's what I typically do. I, I'll microneedle a little bit and then I put on the Signal Pro or plus, and then after it dries, I put on the mask and I, I actually go to bed like <laughs> because you wake up and you just have the best skin yeah. ever. So, um, but obviously that mask is not retail, but I would love for it, it to be a, one of our serums or something like it. Um, yeah, um, to say. we, we kind of get these, uh, the peptides that are anti-inflammatory, that they're uh, uh, anti-aging uh, um, and then mixed with our signal factors. Um, and one of the questions early on was the difference between uh, the, the cells that we had when we were getting them from our cows uh, a few years back versus getting them now from uh, silk proteins. And so the, 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 over the years when we were extracting it from the cows, um, the thing that was the most important thing to remember is that it was the amino acid sequence that communicated to the fibroblast uh, what needed to happen. And this, this, this is the language that over time we discovered that it was a particular sequence. And so getting it from cow, getting it from silk um, is, is, is just a different uh, origin. But the important thing is the sequence, the, the opportunity for the, the, the actual skin or the receptor, the fibroblast receptor to have a communication pathway so that things can flow in and flow out, can stimulate, can regulate, can, and can uh, support, can stimulate and do whatever it needs to do, right? So uh, the only difference is that it's much more efficient, that we're never gonna go on back order from it, that the supplies is, is abundant because we're creating these cultured mediums. Um, you have to remember every 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 product that we have is a cultured medium. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are actually putting ingredients together and allowing them to actually communicate, uh, form a a sort of like a a community and become a complete molecular structure based on selected ingredients. So these aren't just things put together, added uh, preservatives so that they stay well in the shelf. These are pre-selected ingredients and allowing them to kind of coexist, to coexist together and therefore allowing the skin not to have any resistance and trying to figure out what they are or any, any uh, immune um, uh, stimulators in the sense of inflammation, these kinds of things. So the, the technology is there. We needed to just find the sequence and able to just be able to be as efficient, if not more efficient than before. So they're asking, do the silkworm proteins also have the same high DNA match with humans? So being that there's RNA and DNA in the... Well, the, the actual DNA from silkworm is gone. What we're looking at is we're looking at the, the, the protein sequence that we extract from the source. So that's, that's the thing you have to remember. So the sequence, for instance, you can have a million different sequences that, ha that is a completely different um, language. The, the proteins and, and for instance, enzymes. Enzymes are, are proteins. The sequence in which they're actually formed dictates their activity. So enzymes are proteins. They're in a particular sequence. So now they're going to actually break down proteins. They're going to break down uh, fats, they're going to break down waste. So the sequence in proteins is the actual language that is going to then act with the receptor or its um, um, a target. Uh, 
my my house key can only open my house key, right? Taisha's key opens her key. My car uh, remote opens my car alarm, but not hers. It, it's the sequence of how these things are matched. My remote is the sequence of the receiver in my car and not any other car. And that's the way that these things work. It's a lock and key mechanism. So if the proteins are in a sequence that are meant to stimulate or ignite or um, awaken a receptor, because that's the key and then that's the lock and they're gonna be able to open each other and then to create a door that opens. And so the sequencing is the main thing. The communication factors are the main things that we're dealing with here. Um, the, the old way of doing things is you had the complete cellular uh, soup, if you will, and they needed to be a lot of things that needed to be cleaned out and um, left with a very small amount, but yet there was a lot of waste and they were very fragile. So again, um, the results are, are the sequencing, lock and key mechanism to open that door. And the door that we're opening is the ability for your body to produce the fibroblasts, the collagen, the elastin, to be able to hold hydration, to be able to remove waste, to be able to mitigate a lot of the oxidative stress that happens from the environment, uh, UV, UV, UVB, uh, the things that we eat, uh, the stress that we're under, all these different things are just minus, minus, minus. And so if we're addressing the area specifically and, and saturating it with the things that it needs to be able to create a, an environment by which there's very little resistance then the results are gonna be much better, regardless if it's just daily or whether it's because you've had a pretty aggressive procedure, uh, it's all the same. It's once accelerated, one is just slightly slower. So some of these procedures are meant to actually induce a response so that it speeds up the recovery rate or it speeds up the cellular turnover. But if those resources aren't there, then you're gonna end up with exactly the same thing a month or two or three later. What about the DNA match? It's not, about, ma it's not about matching, it's about, again, DNA is proteins, right? DNAs are, are meant, are, you can take anyone's DNA, any, any, any DNA, and when you bring it down to its core level, you're talking about proteins the sequence of proteins that, that create a language. Um, and so here we're dealing with the sequence for the fibroblast in the skin, allowing those resources to come in and then stimulate that wheel that is always turning and creating a better product at the end of the day. So it's not about matching DNAs because then you're talking about genetics. So we're talking about proteins and signaling factors that are uh, creating the sequence for the fibroblast so your body can then do the best work with all the other resources that are coming in with it. It's just that you used to say the uh, bovine uh, proteins were um, had a 98% DNA match with us humans. I think something to that effect. Well, the, the, oh yeah. the thing about DNA, we were talking, when we're doing the, the classes, we're, we're just talking in general terms about DNA and the potential for any kind of uh, uh, inflammatory responses because we were starting with the complete cellular structures of an animal. In this case, we're dealing with just the process of the amino acids, it's in here, the amino acids and its formation and sequence, which is a completely different thing. So when we were using the old products, we were using them uh, so that hopefully, sorry, I don't think you're gonna. Sorry. So that hopefully we were creating a communication factor that the body was was then extracting the signaling factors. I don't think it's gonna reach. Is there? We're trying to plug in the computer before. Sorry, let me just see what close they are. Um, but at the end of the day, when the body and the product a surfboard in the way, so we're, California, <laughs> we're going to do this process where we're still at the end of the day bringing it down and reducing it to the free the, the sequence of the amino acids. So when we teach about different sources, we were teaching about how you know there are other inherited um, 
pitfalls, if you will, uh, with using other sources. And other sources are other uh, sources that already had an immune system uh, developed that already were specialized to become a certain thing. And so by using the bovine at its very early level or early stage, we were mitigating any of those, but that it became a better source versus say uh, sheep or humans or any of that, because there were just too many similarities and the immune system was the main thing. The immune system was already established and that's the thing we wanted to avoid. And so what we're dealing with now is a step ahead of what we were doing in culture mediums and those culture mediums where we're actually processing this whole thing. But now we're able to get it because we, we understand the sequence that we need. It's it almost we need about three to, inches. To okay. There we go, we got it. Wait, oh no, there we go. We're working on it here, okay. Sorry. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. It's just I'm trying to explain it to clients, you know, and I'm trying to find I need an easy way to that a simple way to explain it. Well, let me ask you this: Are they? Are they? Um... They're not asking. I'm volunteering to teach them <laughs> a little bit more. Right. How <laughs> yeah, it works. Gonna... How yeah. it works in their body. Yeah. Right. Well, what I'm what I'm. I think what we needed to do is because the old way of doing things was the long way around, if that makes, makes any sense. I think what we need to focus on is what we have now. And what we have now is the ability to get a shortcut, not have to extract cellular structures from bovine when we already have the communication factors. It's kind of like, I need to hire someone that speaks Russian because I don't speak Russian, right? So do I learn how to speak Russian and it's gonna take me a few years or do I hire an interpreter to get my message across? He knows the communication, he knows how to speak Russian, but the old way of doing it is we were learning how to, how to extract the communication sequence of those proteins so that they actually unlock the fibroblast. Does that make sense? And yes, so, and that's those are the advances in technology since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, and Great. so that's that's the thing. I mean, if we were still dealing with the same same uh, options, it would be at this point with transportation and customs, and you know, we're able to do it here in the United States versus having to do it in France, and so, and so that was a, a major advance, if you will, and that with the shortages and the prices of hay and feed, and it's, it's, it's a big deal. So we were working on this for 10 years and we understood the, the, the communication factors, amino acid formations, and we started looking at other sources and understanding that the, the silk proteins were, were being used at a very high level in, at um, NASA uh, to create um, uh, sheets of fabric uh, for space and uh, weather and clothing. And uh, I mean, there's some that are, they're being produced now that they're using it instead of uh, uh, steel. That's how versatile wow. and strong the fibers can be. And also probably wound healing in space, that kind of stuff? Yes, because obviously um, the, the only wound healing that they have there is uh, sort of like hyperbaric chambers because there's there's really the only oxygen available is in the, in the capsule, but yet it doesn't have any pressure, okay. right? So yes, if you injure yourself, hopefully you don't bump your head on some computer and need stitches up in space. It's going to be a long ways to heal because there's just not the environment necessary for that. So yes, that's a big part of it as well, um, is understanding how the body heals, the, the, the receptors. Um, and so that's, you know, like anything, uh, when you create and you're in the, in the business of enhancing aging and uh, beauty, you're going you're gonna to stumble into things that you can do better, you can do more efficiently. Um, and so that's, that's, that's basically where we're at um, at this point. So 
Okay. Any, okay. No? Um, I have some clients struggling with severe acne and not understanding the process of healing. So any tips that Dr. Aguilar can give me in regards to working with these clients and their patients, meaning that they have patients. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's face it. I mean, you know, acne is very, it's a very stressful condition. I mean, it's on your face, it's psychological, it's emotional, it's, it's mental. And so it is, it is a process. It is a process. Uh, understanding the process, um, it's important that they do everything that they can. Uh, the one mistake that I find people do is sometimes they go, well, I stopped sugar, but I didn't stop gluten and dairy. Oh, then that didn't do anything. So I stopped dairy. Well, I did it for a week and that didn't do anything. So then I stopped gluten and that didn't really do anything. So it's not really working, right? No, no, you get, you know, if, if, if people are coming to you for help, right, that means that they're serious. And so we almost have to really direct them. It's like, hey, you really want to make a change? You really want to maximize your effort and your investment in your skin. This is what you got to do, right? Some of them will do it. Some will do it better than others. And some will really, really, really do it. And those are the ones that are going to have success. So a lot of times, unfortunately, they have to kind of see that it's not really working unless they really try. A lot of times they'll test. But maybe if I just do this, it'll go away. Maybe not. But the stubborn, stubborn cases, you're going to have to really be very, very forthcoming in this is what you do and what you have to do what you end up doing is your your decision in the meantime we're going to try to help you but if you do all of this it's going to work better um, it's no different than withholding information from them when they really want to get better so your job is to really give them the option to do the, all the things that they need whether it's in their capacity to do it or not. But nonetheless, you've done your job and, and you said, this is what it is, this is how you do it. And then they have that option to do it. Um, and walking through the steps, it's gonna take a little time. You gotta work on your diet, you gotta do your protocols, you gotta watch the bad fats. And if you're darker skin, you're gonna have pigmentation, which we'll deal with it later, as soon as we normalize the activity of the, uh, the active breakouts. So um, that's that's where it's at. More communication in the beginning pays dividends in the long run with them. You know, I'm not getting any better. It's only been three days. Okay, um, talk to me in ten days, right? Because this is a process. You've had this for years. Three days is gonna. It's just the beginning. I, uh, I, do you have your 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 nutrition ethics in line? You know, are you watching out for this? Are you doing this? Are you drinking water? Are you, you know, eliminating the cookies and, and everything that they that they actually, you know, the pastas, the breads, on and on and on and on. So alternatives to milk, you know, you have almond milk, you have uh, oat, uh, oat milk, uh, milk now, you have coconut milk, which it's a lot better. And I'd rather them do that than not. Um, because this is a, the long game. You want to make sure the long game is, is, is uh, addressed. Uh, yes, there is a, um, a discount uh, for participants. So you have 24 hours. Um, to use this code, can you guys see that? It's uh, CDP2. Two. Two. And it's 15% off. So whatever you want to order, signal, moisturizers, boosters, cleansers, uh, 24 hours you get 15% off for participants of the, the class. Sorry, I missed that. Um, or just call and just say you're on the, on the call, you'll be fine. But if you do it online, then you just have to add CDP2 and you get a 15% discount. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna really quickly, Lori asked about um, pores. And I have, I, I have a, a pore refining protocol um, where um, I talk about, um, obviously we do the extractions. It, if we're talking about as far as um, what we can do topically, obviously there's internal, which you can back me up on. But um, 
once you've done the extract, you want to extract because what I've noticed in my practice as an esthetician with DNA, I have taken people with giant pores, but I've had to do some special tricks. And so by incorporating different things. So one of the things is extraction. And um, basically once you've extracted the pore, you want to apply something like the lacto. So it can go in and kind of clean up the epithelial cells that line the pore, because they haven't seen sunshine. They haven't seen it. They have, they've got a lot going on. And in order to get them to, to close, um, you want to you want to clean the pore out. Even if you've already done a peel, peel you're going to do another like just on the, the nose or wherever the pores are. And then you're going to use the frozen once you've cleaned that all out because it, it closes the pores down over time with that kind of protocol with the extraction, the peel inside of the, um, the lining of the pore and then the, the frozen. That's what I've experienced. So obviously um, using the Oceana, if they're very oily, it's gonna regulate the oil production, um, peels, peels, Jesner, um, the vitamin A, you know, so all in all, what we do um, is going to start to regulate the oil production, even the, the cryo, the signaling does. So I've seen miracles with, the, with it alone, with acne and, and um, pores, but cleaning out those pores is very, very important. And then someone asked about, you know, how do you get them out when somebody can't even tolerate the extractions? When that happens and there's a sensitivity in the skin, um, our, our lemongrass mass, number one, it's, it's practically a disencruster. We don't really bill it as that because it does so much, mm -hmm. but it's, it's what, I, what helped me with steam um, and peels. So if they're not, if, if you're torturing somebody, obviously there's, there's a, a dead cell buildup. And so they need a series of peels to kind of soften the skin and get through all that, that epidermis that's kind of just dead. Um, so I've had people like that and I've had success eventually like three, four treatments a week apart, peeling them and getting that skin ready and softening it up. And then you can extract them. You don't want to be torturing somebody. Um, and then of course the whole time if they use the vitamin A and um, maybe even the pads, the medi pads, yeah. and they do their cell turnover, especially someone that young. Um, yeah, and watch out for those bad oils. That's, that's the, that's, that's a result. It, right? Yeah, that's yeah. a result of that. That's basically where all that is ending up in, in the layers of the skin, um, which is systemically the body's trying to figure out what's it's a better in my liver and my skin well the skin's not going to kill you it's going to traumatize you emotionally but it won't kill you so in a way it's actually a better choice but um since we're working on the skin we need to make sure that those bad oils the dairies uh the heavy fats um the sugars and all, all that is you know gone and like taisha said prepping the skin with either the fermi mask uh the lemongrass mask doing some light peels, it will dry it up, soak up some of that stuff, you know, create this lack of inflammation, which is what's causing a lot of the sensitivities as well. So when there's inflammation, there's obviously some nerve involvement and that becomes very, very um, painful. Um, so, or you can put a sock in his mouth and have him bite it while you do the extractions. But that's another, that's mm -hmm. another choice. Oh yeah, sorry about that, Lori. I was actually, I was, re I was replying to you and then I went to um, Danielle's question about a 14 year old teen. So I, I didn't mean to put those together and make it sound like I was talking about someone older, but um, yeah, same, I mean, kind of same thing. Cell turnover is really crucial. Um, and if they end up being very open afterwards, I mean, I, you know, a little microneedling with the cryo is really great. Uh, but we've got to get the pores cleaned out in order to get those pores to close. Yeah. And I'll email you. I have a, I'll, I'll email you my pore refining protocol. Um, the LEDs can help. I mean, but we've got to clean those pores out. So um, I think that's it for that. Oh, the, the best extraction in the face. Yeah. What's your projected vision for the future of DNA? I have noticed that less is more and that people are waking up spiritually. There is less need for such active ingredients. I'm curious about what you are seeing. Thank you. Well, it depends what you describe as active ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. um, active for me is that they're, they're not synthetic, that they're alive, that they're dynamic, 
that they have an interaction with the skin, but active doesn't necessarily mean uh, stimulating or um, exfoliating uh, or you know um, inflammatory, if you will. Um, so we've always said that less is better. You know, we use very little product. We 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 don't necessarily like to um, uh, have you know 50 ingredients in our in our formulas. Um, so what I see in the future is I do see hopefully that there is a shift happening. Uh, we've been talking about the four pillars where people want the spa experience, of course, because it's it's nice. You know, it's a difference between you going in and having a doctor's visit in a very sterile room with, you know, uh, you know, paper, disposable paper, and you sit in there in a robe, it's very uncomfortable. It's not very honorary, right? And things are probably gonna hurt whatever they do versus really being pampered. The aromatherapy, the scents, the textures, the, the, the touch, these are things that are necessary for healing as well you know so i see obviously the spa experience has been around since roman times and even before that so that's not going anywhere um i do see uh more um updated more um sort of high performance ingredients that are from a natural uh source for sure um that are giving you the clinical uh, results that people want. I also see uh, higher, higher um, informed clients. Um, I think, I think that's that's an important thing. I, I see the incorporation of the bio uh, the dynamics of the body, including the gut, um, incorporating it with everything we talked about today: the oils, the gluten, the inflammatories. I see people not really just looking at the face as that's where the problem is. I see them looking inside and thinking, you know what? I need to probably reduce my stress, you know? So what do I do? Um, I need to enjoy doing something, you know? The last couple of years have been pretty stressful for a lot of people. The number two uh, symptoms that people come in since this whole COVID situation has been insomnia and anxiety. Those are the two things that I would see super rarely, right? Everyone has a, you know, two or three days a week of not sleeping and it passes. But now it's been to the point where it is, I mean, you just had someone, right? When you walk in, <laughs> she overheard a conversation. I mean, I've tried this, I've tried that. I, I can't sleep. I it's just, it's like, yeah, I know. This is like the new club. People aren't sleeping. And plug your Wi-Fi when you sleep at night too, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's like a lot of stuff that's happening. And so the whole world is changing. Uh, you know, what we knew two years ago to what we know today is completely changed. And in the next two years, it'll be completely foreign to what it is today. So is that going to affect the skincare industry? It's going to affect your job. It's going to affect how people see, of course, how I think people are going to, yes, people are going to really be much more informed because they want value. Um, you know, we don't know about inflation. I mean, two years ago, I wasn't paying over $5 for a gallon of gas, but now we are, uh, which then is gonna then tap into the resources of what people have. So it's important for you to really be forthcoming about your value, right? If you're using DNA, you're using something unlike anything else that they probably have used if it's their first time, okay? To bring value to that expenditure of resources for them, they would need to walk out of there knowing that they got the best deal, the best treatment, the best experience from the practitioner, uh, the best products there is, because that is enough for them to come back. That is enough for them to know that if every time they come to you, it's gonna be for them and not a cookie cutter situation, right? They want to know that the products that they're using aren't full of toxicity and synthetics. Uh, they, they need to know that their experience there is going to be a very honoring experience to their, their healing process. Um, you know, a lot of them are for the first time realizing that they're aging and that's not a very, you know, good space to be in, uh, but they don't realize that they can age very gracefully as well.
Um, and that is your job as a skincare consultant. Uh, you're not a skincare technician only, right? You're a counselor, you're an advisor, you're a teacher. And these are the things we have to remember. So think of that, how I see the industry changing, I see it expanding. I see it expanding into you being a source of wealth of information, a wealth of uh, knowledge, and a source of comfort, if you will, because you are the expert and they come to you for that. So to not have the complete picture in mind is really not giving them the value that they need and what they're looking for. Um, so that's how I see it changing, you know. The skin is a reflection of everything else. Uh, to just address the skin, some people are very good at it, but then they just never move from that, that, that constraints of the skin. Um, and so I think understanding what contributes to glycation, like acne, and hyperpigmentation, and premature aging, uh, and there's a million other things that, is, that are under your scope of expertise is gonna set you aside from the technicians, if you will, right? Uh, that's how I see this industry changing. So um, we're a family here. We're gonna be doing more of these. We're gonna be covering a lot more uh, expanding uh, dynamics of our field, which I think are important, not to forget the basics, but I think understanding how things are moving and changing are gonna really solidify you as an expert uh, someone that real, really makes a difference in, in, in the way people are perceiving. You know, inflation is moving up. Who knows where it's going to end up or not. But if you offer something um, that is for them, you know, I, you know I, everything is shifting. You know, we look at real estate prices are through the roof. Why? Because there's a, there's a, there's a difference in how people perceive their homes now, right? It's a, so, it's a sanctuary now. The world is crazy. If I'm going to be at home doing Zoom calls, working from home, I better like my home. You know, I better feel good in my home. So my perspective of home, the value of that has increased. Why? Because we're spending more time at home. Kids are not, we're not schooled. Now they're, they're doing a lot, of, a lot of stuff from home as well. So that's what's driving some of the industry. Some of the other stuff, I mean, you know, I see the, the horse industry, that doesn't make any sense, right? You used to be able to buy a good horse for, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars. I mean, I see horses that used to be going for 5,000 or going for 50,000. Why is that? Because people find value in things that they enjoy doing because the world is kind of going crazy, right? So people are putting more effort and more emphasis on this in their families versus other things that they used to. So you're no exception. Someone to come to you for an experience, for healing, for teaching, for, for understanding things is going to elevate, okay? Don't for one moment think that what you're doing is in jeopardy of actually being instinct or going out of style or people are not going to want to pay more believe me when i tell you your services when you're doing it right and you're partnered with dna because you're covering everything your profession your services are going to be held at a much higher level just like real estate just like other things that are actually feeding the soul feeding their 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 dynamics because the world isn't and, and that's why you become such a, a, a pivotal um, partner in this journey that all humanity is going through right now. And so believe me when I say you're going to be busier than ever because people need your help. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to sign off. If there's any other questions, uh, please email us, call us. Uh, we'll give you the... Um, the, the time and date of the next one that's coming. We're gonna to try to do these uh, once every probably four, five, six weeks. Uh, we're gonna ask for more questions. We're gonna ask for topic, subject topics. Um, we're gonna to ask for anything that you need. 
we're here to help. And again, don't forget, 24 hours for 15% off and anything you want to buy for being present and learning and being part of the team. Okay. Thank you guys. Everybody have a great day. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. <laughs>